Hello students, welcome back. So we're going to continue on talking about Monopoly. I'm going to give a brief review of the things that we discussed in lecture and then we'll continue on with the lecture um, and discuss the topic of price discrimination. So um, we know that monopolists are maximizing profits and the key ideas are going to maximize profits finding that quantity where marginal revenue is equal to marginal cost. So um, remember there's a two-step process for the monopolist. First he finds or she finds the quantity that's going to maximize their profits and then after you find that quantity you go up to the demand curve to find the price that the monopolist can at most charge to sell all of those units. So here's a graph and notice we have the intersection of marginal revenue and marginal cost that independent of the demand curve is going to determine the quantity that maximizes the profits of the monopolist. And so that intersection labeled as A is the one you're going to look for if you're solving a problem. Um, that's going to maximize the profits and then taking that quantity now we use the demand curve and we find the monopolist's profit. So if you're doing a problem on Ignithium and you don't see a graph that looks similar to this. Now remember the first five questions on Ignithium are gonna have a constant marginal cost curve so it's gonna look a little bit different. It won't be upward sloping. You'll see an example of that in a minute. But on the last five questions, if you don't see a graph that looks like this, then um, hit reload and, and look for another one because this is really the way things should look. So, and again, as we said in class, if you compare this to the monopoly outcome, for the competitive firm, the marginal revenue is the price that's being charged in the market. So price equals marginal cost and equals marginal revenue is the competitive firm's outcome. In monopoly, if you paid attention to the last graph, you're always going to see the price is going to be greater than the marginal revenue and the marginal cost. Okay, and it's also really handy to follow this little sequence of algebra and note that we can always write profit, not just the monopolist profit, but we saw this in the chapter on competition too, is price minus average total cost times the quantity that the firm is selling. And that's the last bullet point. So if we go back to our graph, we can identify the monopolist profit. Remember the point B up there um, identifies the price on the demand curve that will enable the monopolist to sell all of its quantity and that price minus average total cost you see the point C is the average total cost times the quantity which is the distance between C and D that the monopolist sells that rectangle corresponds to the monopolist profits its price minus average total cost that's B minus C times the quantity, which is C minus D. So that's the height of that rectangle times its width, and that's the monopolist profit. Okay, so I threw this example in here, and we, we discussed it in lecture, but only because it's a really nice comparison, and the first five questions on Ignithium deal only with constant marginal cost. So you can see the marginal cost and the marginal revenue intersect and then the area above that um, it can correspond to the consumer surplus that's above the monopolist price which here is labeled as the the price during the patent life because this example is about a monopoly created by, created by a patent on a drug and so the consumer surplus is the area below the demand curve but above that price during the patent life it's a triangle up there and um, if the market was competitive then the price would be equal to the marginal cost which is labeled as the price after the patent expires and so then uh, consumer sur surplus would be this bigger triangle down here as opposed to the smaller triangle at the top so um, that should help you, again, you should look at this slide when you're trying to solve the first five problems on Ignithium, okay, with the constant marginal cost. 
So we're also interested in identifying the deadweight loss associated with monopoly, and we call that the welfare cost because we're talking about social welfare, and our measure of social welfare is total surplus. So um, the real issue is the monopoly, by setting its price higher than the competitive price, is going to create this, this deadweight loss triangle, which we're going to see on this, this next graph I'm going to show you. So, okay, so this triangle here corresponds to what in the case of a competitive outcome, which is being labeled as this efficient quantity here, that's the competitive outcome. So the monopoly outcome is less, and, and if we just had a standard competitive equilibrium, then all of the area between this demand curve, and remember the marginal cost curve is a supply curve in competition, would be consumer and producer surplus. But we lose some amount of consumer and producer surplus, what we're calling deadweight loss. And that's the inefficiency of monopoly. Okay. So um, again, the issue is that the monopolist produces less than what would be efficient and that generates this deadweight loss and in your presentation that you saw in class and in the book they often compare this to the deadweight loss caused by a tax and really just the difference is that um, the monopolist is getting that extra revenue as opposed to the government in the case of a tax <clears throat> okay so now we want to talk about this idea of price discrimination and so if you remember, the monopolists, when they just charge a single price to all customers, every time they want to entice or incentivize a new customer to buy the product, they have to lower the price of the product. And that's different than a competitive firm because the competitive firm is just a price taker. They take the market price and, and uh, they can't manipulate the price at all. So, so traditionally, the monopolist has this trade-off. If they lower the price, they lower it for all customers, including the ones that were previously paying a higher price. And so they have this trade-off between what we call the price effect and the quantity effect on their revenue. But because of that, you might think that a clever monopolist might try to figure out how to charge a higher price to those who are willing to pay the higher price and let yet lower the price to let additional customers purchase the good. Because the issue for the monopolist isn't that um, you know, their price is equal to their cost of production, equal to the marginal cost, rather the price is above their marginal cost. So they could expand production and still generate additional profits. But in order to do that, they have to figure out a way to charge different prices to different customers. So price discrimination is not generally possible in these competitive markets because everyone's selling at the same price. But if you have market power and the monopolist has market power, then they can influence the price. And, and there's one extreme case, which is perfect price discrimination, which is when the monopolist knows for each customer what's their maximum willingness to, to pay, and they're able to charge that exact price to each customer, that exact price that matches the willingness to pay of that customer, and is different. Remember, the height of the demand curve measures the willingness to pay for each of the customers. So if the monopolist can do this, then they can continue to charge a price and a different price to attract more and more customers without ever losing any money on the prior sales that they made. So you might also realize, and there's a, 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 a caveat to this, that in order for perfect price discrimination to work, it must not be possible for um, firms or for prior customers to resale the product. Um, but given that, um, the, the monopolist can extract more and more revenue. Okay, so the outcome in price discrimination has these two important effects. It's going to increase the monopolist's profit and it's going to reduce deadweight loss. 
So that's going to seem a little bit strange because usually the outcome in a monopoly is as the monopolist earns more profit, it actually reduces the quantity available and that generates more deadweight loss. So for a single price monopolist, this is the outcome. We have profit for the monopolist, and this is assuming that there's no fixed costs, okay? Um, and you also have consumer surplus. So this consumer surplus and the profit represents the total surplus. And what's left over is what would have been part of consumer surplus, but now it's deadweight loss. So this is another really good um, graph for the first five problems on Ignithium. But now, note, right, if there's perfect price discrimination, all of this area becomes monopolist profit and there is no deadweight loss. So profit is part of total surplus. So this is just as efficient as the competitive outcome. All of this area in the case of competition would be consumer surplus and now all of that surplus is transferred to the monopolist. But remember, all we care about when we're talking about efficiency in economics is that surplus goes to someone and here what's happening is that for each and every consumer, the monopolist is charging a different price and their full willingness to pay and then um, subtract off the monopolist cost, which is from the red line, and all of this becomes producer surplus or profit for the monopolist. But that's the case of perfect price discrimination. If we had imperfect price discrimination, we would still have some deadweight loss, but it would be smaller than the case of the single price monopolist. Okay, so um, what are good examples of price discrimination? Well, this isn't perfect price discrimination, but in, in the real world, we know that there are different prices charged to different consumers. So in the case of movie tickets, you get discounts depending upon when you see the movie, early or late or during the week, and matinee prices, kids get different prices. Um, airline tickets are similar depending upon when you travel um, and there are discount coupons that you can get for certain businesses so if you have the coupon you pay a different amount than somebody who doesn't have the coupon uh, in the case of financial aid um, you know that fish, financial aid reduces the cost of attending college some people get financial aid some people don't so different customers are, are paying a different amount for going to college and also you get volume discounts and quantity discounts. If you buy a big package, like at Costco, you pay a different amount than somebody is buying the same thing in a smaller package. So to summarize, um, monopolists can raise their profits by charging different prices to different buyers based on their willingness to pay, the, the buyer's willingness to pay. And price discrimination actually increases economic efficiency. It raises economic welfare and lessens deadweight loss. Okay, so um, that's it for Monopoly, and I'll be talking to you soon.